Here we go. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike Lamb. I am a member of the board of directors at the Drupal Association. I also work at Pfizer, where I am director of global digital engineering. So DrupalCons are without a doubt my favorite conferences of, of the year, so it's great to be with you all today. I really enjoyed yesterday morning hearing about all these, these fantastic Drupal stories. Megan Sanaki, who was here this morning, talks about this DrupalCon aha moment. So this moment at a DrupalCon where you have some kind of profound observation, or you make a key connection with somebody, or you, you learn something that's particularly relevant for your work. I'm sure you, you all have these experiences. My first uh, DrupalCon aha moment was back in 2012. And this is when DrupalCon was in Munich. Were many of you at, in Munich? Pretty much everybody, many, many people in Munich. So 2012, this was really at the beginning of our Drupal journey at Pfizer. We had just decided we were moving to Drupal. We were moving about 60 different non-Drupal systems, migrating all of those over, over to Drupal. And at the same time, there was an expectation that we take a huge leap forward in terms of the, the digital capabilities that we're offering the business. So it really felt pretty, pretty ambitious. In Munich, I attended my very first trivia night. So it was, it was, really, it was a really amazing experience to spend my evening with this incredibly passionate group of people who were all spending, spending their own time, having a great time, being extremely competitive about what were the geekiest geekiest of Drupal details. So as I was standing there, I was thinking to myself about some of the challenges that we had in front of us in building our, our global Drupal platform. And I was thinking for all those challenges that we had, all of the skills and expertise we needed to really push through those challenges, those, those skills and expertise were right there in the room. And it felt like this great aha moment. It really filled me with energy. And I left there extremely confident in our decision to go with Drupal. And pretty much the next day, I started hiring people for my team from the Drupal community. And then I started working with, uh, with Drupal vendors who I'd met at DrupalCon to, to start building our site. So people had a lot of experience working with Drupal. So we've come a really long way since 2012. So we've actually launched more than 1,000 websites on Drupal now. It's actually many more than 1,000. And if we average it out, it's more than one site launch every single day since we made that decision to go with Drupal four years ago. So Drupal really has been, been truly successful for us. It's faster and less costly for us to launch sites with, with more capability than, than they ever had before. And I know that that success is down to a huge amount of time and commitment and dedication from, from the Drupal community. So I want to say a really sincere thank you to everybody for building uh, for building Drupal the software and the community. I know we wouldn't have been successful without you all, so, so thank you very much. I think you should give yourself a, a round of applause for this. <laughs> thank you. So this quote came up several times yesterday, and I really, really like this quote. I, I tried to track back where it came from, and I believe there was a board retreat in 2010 in San Francisco where that's the first, first time I saw this mentioned. And I think we all have our own perspective on this, but my perspective is this Drupal come for the community, sorry, come for the software, stay for the community. It's just as true for large organizations as it is for individuals, or all organizations coming for, to Drupal as it is for individuals. If you are just coming to, uh, to Drupal.org and downloading Drupal and building endless sites, but not getting involved in this, this fantastic community, you're really missing out on the best part of, of Drupal especially now as there are more opportunities than there have ever been to, to really get involved. So I just want to talk about a couple of those where we were starting to get involved. So we heard about this yesterday, the, the issue credit system on Drupal.org. Who's, who's heard, about the, heard about this before or heard about this yesterday? Fantastic. So I think this is, this, is a, this is a great opportunity. So if your job is working with Drupal, you should really go and make sure that your company has an organization page on Drupal.org and that your team members, your vendors, really everybody who is involved in building your, uh, building your Drupal sites or involved in, in Drupal development should, should, go to, uh, should attribute their contributions to your organization. And I think there are many, many reasons for doing this. Um, we heard about some of those yesterday. But a diff slightly different perspective, top of my list of why I encourage my team members to do this is it really, 
it really shows your team the, the behaviors that you value. So if your team members, your vendors, are building Drupal sites, and while they're doing that, they make an improvement to a module, and they don't contribute that, that improvement back to Drupal.org, but they maintain a local version, you know, they're not going to be getting future improvements. They're not going to be getting security updates. It's not the right way of, of doing these things. So in my experience, as we've been building these many, many Drupal sites, the teams and the individuals who contribute to Drupal.org, without a doubt, build higher quality Drupal sites than those that don't get involved in, in the community. The people who contribute here, I, I find they're, they're, they're proud of the code that they're writing. Collaboration becomes second, becomes second nature. And they build things expecting them to be reused by, by other people. And these aren't behaviors you typically, I'm typically seeing if you're not getting involved in the community and not, not contributing. So yesterday we heard also about this brilliant blog post that Dries and Matthew tifted. I'd encourage you to all, all go read that if you, if you haven't already. Um, many companies are starting to, to get involved here, and I think it really is a good opportunity to get recognition for, for your contributions, but also through the process get a lot of value in terms of the quality of sites and, and the code that's been, been developed by your teams. Another great opportunity is the strategic initiative. So these were announced in, um, in DrupalCon New Orleans. Heard a lot yesterday as well about these. And I think these strategic initiatives combined together with the, the regular release cycle of Drupal is really powering a lot of the innovation that we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing right now. When organizations are making decisions about their digital roadmaps and investment in the digital roadmaps, there's typically this key decision point that these companies are making. And that, that decision is, in order to push forward our capability, should we buy software that's going to drive us forward, or should we be building software that is, is driving us forward? And there are pros and cons of each one of these. But when the capability you're looking for is lined up with what the Drupal community or where the, the Drupal roadmap is heading, these strategic initiatives can really be the sweet spot excuse me, between these two ends of the spectrum. So many members of my team are involved in the workflow initiative. And it's been great to see perspectives from across the Drupal community, all the way from conceptually how this could work, other use cases that people have for this, through to how the data should be stored, all the way through to specific UX implementation details. So through this process, I have no doubt that we're going to end up with a better product or, or better capability than we would have done if we, had, if we had gone this alone. And while this is pretty ambitious in terms of what it's delivering, I have, I have no doubt of the, about the value of that investment. And you know, we're, we're now building this capability in a way that everybody else can use it, but at the same time, we have a good idea about the capability that will be delivered and when it will be delivered, and that enables you to start building a business strategy around some of these capabilities. So when your digital roadmap, there's capabilities that you're expecting or you want to have in the future aligns with the Drupal community and where some of these initiatives are heading, this is a really good way to get involved and get, get value and return on your investment in Drupal. Of course, there are also lots of opportunities to get involved in, in these initiatives this week. So I'm just going to run through some special announcements pretty quickly. So Wi-Fi, I fully expect everybody is already connected to, to, to the Wi-Fi. If you can keep that to one device at a time, we should be able to keep that nice and stable. SSID is Drupal. Password is Dublin 2016. Coffee breaks, I know these are extremely important. There's one, one this morning, one this afternoon, free coffee break sponsored by Commerce Guys. So thank you very much to Commerce Guys for sponsoring those. And then there's paid coffee that's available all, all day as well. Lunch, so this is the same deal as yesterday. Um, there's a two hour break that overlaps with two sessions or, or boffs. So you can eat lunch and then attend a session or the other way around. Um, vegetarian and gluten-free meals in the regular line, and then there's the nutritional information desk for any other special meals. So thanks to SiteGround for, uh, for sponsoring lunch today. Social media. So you can follow us on the, the uh, European Twitter account, DrupalCon EUR. Uh, these are the hashtags to get in, uh, involved. For the hashtag you're looking for for today's keynote is DC EMA. On Facebook at DrupalCon, Flickr, DrupalCon Dublin 2016. Okay, so code of conduct. So everybody deserves to have a, have a great con. If you have any issues or questions while, while you're here, please contact George or Emma. Their details, their details are down here. Trivia night. 
So this should be a fantastic evening. So this is tomorrow evening, 9 p.m. until midnight at the round room at Mansion House. I hope to see, see everybody there. This should be a lot of fun. Thanks to Consult and Design for sponsoring this one. Uh, Drupal Association booth, so this is uh, the great place to hang out to get your t-shirts, mugs, stickers, all of your Drupal, uh, Drupal branded goodies. There were also some book signings yesterday, there's even more today, so some great PHP and Drupal 8 books you can get signed over at the Drupal Association booth. Code sprints, so uh, there's plenty, plenty of opportunities to get involved and contribute to Drupal through this, through this DrupalCon, all through this week here in the Convention Center, so that's in Wicklow Hall. There's also the 24-hour uh, code sprints uh, or the, the code lounge over at the Gibson. And then Friday is sprint day, lots of opportunities there. So there's the general sprints, the mentored core sprint, and then the first-time sprinter workshop. So even if you've never uh, contributed or, or attended these sprints before, there's, there's an opportunity to get involved at the, uh, the first-time sprinter workshop. Then extended sprints over the weekend and an opportunity to meet your sprint mentors as well. A few session changes, so um, a, few, a few new sessions today, and then one cancelled session at the, at the end of the day, so please adjust your schedules as you, as you need to, see some, of these, see some of these sessions. BOFs, so the schedules for the BOFs are at the top of the elevator on level two, go check that out, I think there's quite a few good BOFs. And then session evaluations. A lot of people have spent, spent a lot of time, obviously, preparing their presentations um, for, the, for, for DrupalCon. So please go over to the event site. If you visit the, the page for, for the, uh, uh, the session you went to see, you just click this button to provide feedback. It's really useful to help improve sessions for, uh, for future DrupalCon. So please do that for all the sessions that you go and see. I want to say thank you to our sponsors. So this is, DrupalCon has become a pretty big event, and it just wouldn't be possible to do this without uh, a lot of uh, support from these great companies. So thank you very much to the sponsors. Let's see if this is going to click. So many of them are here as well, so please do go and visit them in the exhibit hall. Whoops. Say thank you to the Drupal Association supporters as well. The Drupal Association do many, run many, many great programs, and those wouldn't be possible without the support of these very generous companies. So thank you, thank you very much. We all depend on the, the infrastructure uh, that the, uh, the Drupal Association provide. So that's everything from me. I want to introduce uh, one of our sponsors. That's Brian House, Senior Vice President at Acquia. Thank you. Thank you, thanks, Mike. Um, it's nice to uh, it's nice to be here. It's as uh, I've calculated last week. This is my 16th DrupalCon, um, and I even had the pleasure of presenting with Mike back in DrupalCon Prague. Um, he told me somewhere along the way, I think it was that session, that they had done uh, 500 sites in about 500 days uh, at the time. So to see that they're well over a thousand, it's uh, pretty amazing to watch them, and we see that over and over again. Um, but also really great, one of the things I really enjoy here is that a lot of my colleagues come and speak at DrupalCon, so there's more than 20 uh, different Aquians that are giving technical sessions here. So uh, there's a lot of great developer content, a lot of uh, experience with the Drupal uh, project and community and co contribution, so I encourage you to check out their sessions and go see support the folks from Aquia, as well as, as many of you that are presenting as well. There's some really, really great content there. Um, I wanted to bring attention to two things that, uh, that are, I think are relevant for you as Drupal developers um, and it might be interesting. So one, uh, we've introduced a, a, a new tool, it's called Pipelines. This is an automated set of build and test uh, CI capabilities that are fully integrated with our cloud platform, Acquia Cloud. Um, so this is a new set of tools we're doing so if, uh, to help people that are um, building custom CI processes with Jenkins and Puppet and things like that. So we're building that all integrated right into Acquia Cloud. That's in beta now, so if you use Acquia Cloud, I encourage you to check it out and get involved in the beta. Um, the other thing that's really cool, I think, for developers is we've actually just launched a set of uh, Drupal 8 SDKs, um, and these are um, help, helping provide Drupal for other front-end technologies. So we have a, uh, um, it's a project called Water Wheel, and so we've added, uh, Waterwheel JS, which is Drupal for JavaScript developers, and Waterwheel Swift, which is uh, Drupal for Swift developers. And so this is code that's up um, and available in our Git repository, so uh, on GitHub. 
So you can go to the Acquia repository and pull this down, but uh, if you're starting to do decoupled applications and things, there's some really cool technologies, and we're building uh, SDKs to make Drupal more um, work very well with those technologies. So I encourage you to check both of those out. They're all built on Drupal 8's REST APIs, so some really, really interesting technology there. Um, so it's uh, my pleasure to, uh, to introduce our keynote speaker today, um, Emer Coleman. She's a uh, experienced digital leader with a great, tremendous experience in both the public and private sector. Um, she's an associate at EY, and she's CEO, CEO of her own firm, um, Disruption. And really, you know, as you know, she's an expert in open data. She's the chair of the Open Data Government Board Initiative here in Ireland and advising the Irish government on open data practices and policies. And she's the architect of the London Data Store, which helped release all of London's data for public use um, and, for, and for people to build applications on. So uh, she's an impressive speaker. She, in 2014, she was Silicon, named Silicon Republic's top 100 women in STEM. That's uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. So she's a She's a well-recognized leader in her space, so please give a warm DrupalCon welcome to Emer Coleman. Well, it's lovely to be here at uh, DrupalCon. I have to say, since I know Dublin's quite a party town, I'm very impressed so many of you are here so early this morning. Uh, so before I start to talk about technoethics, um, just to give a bit of background, about myself. So I've worked in a number of areas in my career. I've worked uh, in the arts, I've worked as a journalist, uh, I've worked in government, and I've worked in technology. Um, and really over the last year, those kind of four things have come together uh, in what I've been writing and blogging and giving talks about, which is technoethics. Um, and so to, to explain what is technoethics, well, it's really about three things. It's about people, it's about privacy, and it's about profit. And I'll touch on those three things over the course of my talk this morning. But just to go back to the arts for a moment. Uh, so uh, there's a, a mathematical formula behind beauty, which is called the golden ratio. Uh, and artists have used it for many years to calculate the most aesthetically pleasing proportions for their work. So when we look at Michelangelo's The Birth of Adam, the space between God's finger and Adam's finger is where the golden ratio divides. So it's interesting to see that artists use mathematics as part of their creative process. Interesting, but not surprising, perhaps, uh, Paul Graham in Hackers and Painters says there are huge similarities between software developers, engineers, and artists. But that's where I think the similarities end, because all of you in the room today who are involved in, in code and in software development have the potential for much more influence on our society than Michelangelo could ever have dreamed of when he painted The Birth of Adam. We know that software is eating the world, but I wonder how many of you spend time on an ongoing basis thinking about the impact of your work. Because make no mistake, you're literally coding the future social and economic well-being of our society. And while you may think of yourselves as engineers, I, I would argue that you've long ago moved into the realm of social engineering. And the history of social engineering for humankind has never been great. And traditionally, we associate social, uh, social engineering with totalitarian regimes, with governments who wanted to instrumentally um, get their citizens to act in a certain way. But the thing about totalitarian regimes was that they could be toppled by democracy, by, by collective action. And when we think about government, I was always amused in 2009 when I worked for the mayor of London as his director of digital projects, and I was tasked with setting up the London Data Store, how concerned people were about how much data the government had about them. Because at that time, the amount of government data that people had that was actually usable was pretty risible. But we know now, post Snowden, exactly what governments have, exactly the amount of data they have on us. We have currently legislation pending in the UK, which is called the Snoopers Charter. And when David Cameron, then Prime Minister, spoke about the Snoopers Charter, he said, do we really want to have a means of communication between people which we cannot read. And I find that an extraordinary statement for a prime minister of a democratically elected country, of a democratic uh, country to say, because that's the kind of thing we associate with totalitarian regimes. And in fact, when a former lieutenant of the Stasi was asked, what did he think of the Snoopers Charter legislation? His response was this. 
You know, this would have been a dream for us. So much information on so many people. And if we return to the notion of social engineering, what does it really mean? What do you require in order for social engineering of a society to be successful? Well, you really only need two things. You need a large body of information about the society you wish to engineer, and you need the tools with which to do it. Now, who might have that? So when we think about Google, and we think about what search engines know about us, I mean, this is a long list concepts and topics discussed in email, as well as email attachments. The content of the websites that we visited, demographic information including income, sex, race, marital status, geographic information, psychographic information, personality type, values, attitudes, interests, and lifestyle interests. Previous searches, information about documents a user viewed or edited, browsing activity. That's a pretty comprehensive body of knowledge about our society. In fact, it's a historically unprecedented body of knowledge about our society. Academics who undertake research couldn't even dream of a sample size that big. And when they do work with sample sizes, sizes which are risible in comparison to this, they are bound by ethical frameworks. Where are the ethical frameworks that bound this data? Well, there aren't any. And it's what the author Frank Pasquale refers to in his book, The Black Box Society, as the secret algorithms that govern the flow of information and money. Think about the language in a response Mark Zuckerberg gave at a conference when he was asked about privacy. He said, I don't understand your question. If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. So again, we have the language of a dictator here. It's a, it's a totalitarian type statement. Because only dictators require totally transparent citizenry instead of a free press. And why does this matter more broadly for us as society? It matters because it affects the democratic process. How many of you have seen the last uh, season of House of Cards? So you'll be familiar with the fictitious search engine called Polyhop that's used by Frank Underwood's opponent to gain the upper hand. And so is this really art imitating life? And according to Dr. Robert Epstein in the uh, American Institute of Behavioral Insight and Technology, his research shows that search engine rankings, which equate with trust, can influence voter preference by up to 20%. And why that matters is because if I am a politician in the UK, there's a period before every election which we call the PERDA period. So you're precluded from putting out information that will benefit one political party over another. So if I'm a politician in the UK and I feel I've been unfairly treated, I can go to the Electoral Commission and seek redress. But if I'm a politician who is suddenly not appearing in the search engine rankings as high as they would like, and therefore my voter preference is impacted, to whom should I seek redress? And I'm not saying that Google do tweak the algorithm, <clears throat> but let's uh, look at some examples here. So autocomplete is, of course, based on what uh, uh, users are searching for. If you put in labor is, you get isn't working, right? Is dead. If you put in conservatives are, you get nothing. And so if we look at this recently with Hillary Clinton's um, health, you know, widely covered in the US, uh, that she had sort of had a small collapse, obviously the pneumonia. And when you looked across the search engines, Google suggested that we were all searching for her healthcare reform plans. Whereas the, other, the others were, were actually looking at her actual health. So when Google are questioned about these things, they don't really seem to have a very transparent or satisfactory response. But that's a huge amount of societal influence that affects us and our democracies. So I'm going to move now to the question of what do we do when our labor is no longer required. So there's a huge rise in robotics and automation. And of course, we thought when we were naive that the robots were going to come and take all their crap jobs. But now it turns out they're coming to take all our jobs. If we look at that in terms of the legal profession, we're talking about a ratio of 1 to 500 required because of e-discovery software. You all know this. You can go through lists of industries that are all under threat. But let's go back to 1891 and, and look at Karl Marx when he asked the question, 
Does a worker in a cotton factory produce only cotton? No, he produces capital. He produces values which serve in you to command his work and to create by means of it new value. So what does Marx look like in the age of Google? When you email, are you only corresponding? No, you're producing capital, data. You're producing values which serve in you to command your work and to create means of it new value. So when we started on our digital journey, free was brilliant, it was fantastic. We got all this stuff for free. And, and as we matured on that digital journey, we realized, well, if we weren't paying for the product, we were the product. And now I think where the next stage of that digital journey is going to go when people realize their jobs are threatened, when robotics and automations hollows out the middle class, people are going to want a very different contract with these technology companies who are massively profiting from every keystroke we make. So we are all becoming shadow workers in a digital economy, but for no payment. To talk again about life imitating art, I'm sure many of you will have seen the science fiction movie Elysium. And of course that depicts a world in the future where the super rich are living on another planet and all of the rest of us are left behind scrambling over scarce resources. And you have to ask yourself, you know, is, is that possible? Is that as far-fetched as it might seem? And then you look at the amounts of money that all of the large technology companies are pumping into space travel. Billions and billions of dollars. When you hear Elon Musk say, I want to die on Mars, just not on impact. When you see in 2013 PayPal developing intergalactic currency, you need to ask yourself if a secondary service is already being built and they haven't even made the journey yet, is it gonna happen? And I'm using this example because I'm trying to inject a sense of urgency into a debate. Because if we can't solve the ethical issues and dilemmas around technology on our own planet, imagine trying to come up with governance and ethical solutions for a future one. The 1966 Outer Space Treaty, which is signed by every country, says that space exploration is going to be undertaken for the benefit of all mankind. Do you really think that's, go, that's how this is going to play out? Because I guarantee you, when they pull that door closed on the spaceship, the last thing we'll see is this. <laughs> well, <laughs> <sorry. coughs> so I think what we need to look at here is how we as a technology community can really start addressing these issues and trying to look at providing leadership in a difficult and challenging environment. We need to look at new business models where reciprocity and return are baked into our digital economy. And we need to look at the equitable redistribution of digital dividends. I mean, how is it right that we all shared our photos with Instagram, but they didn't share any of the billion? And corporate social responsibility is nothing new. You know, for 30 years, we've admonished companies who exported their physical waste to developing countries. And yet we have here outsourced workers in Manila who are cleaning Facebook contact for all sorts of horrendous things, pedophilia, suicides, beheadings, for a dollar an hour. These are not the Facebook employees who benefited from the highest IPO on Wall Street. These are workers in developing countries being paid a dollar an hour to do deeply distressing work for which they get no psychological support. So when we think about ethics, we think about Aristotle when he said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And so I think as technologists, we have to keep asking the question, we can do this, but should we? Technologists look for efficiencies all the time. I remember a number of years ago visiting Botswana, doing an open data uh, audit uh, with the World Bank. And while we were there, we toured around lots and lots of government buildings. And everywhere we went, there were people on the floor sorting piles of paper. We would all think, looking at that, oh, that should be digitized. That's like a no-brainer. But the consequences of doing that are very different in Botswana, as they will be everywhere. Because digitization, that, that particular inefficiency is actually beneficial for that society at that point in time. So when we go back to the birth of Adam, what I'm saying is for you as developers and as, as software engineers, it's not God's hand anymore, it's yours. And so with great you know, power comes great responsibility. So what are the questions 
I'd urge you to ask. I think you should consider broadly who is affected by your work. To treat human beings with due respect, to ask how the public, if reasonably informed, would view your decisions, and to ask how the least empowered would be affected by those. As for me, I have recently moved from London to Manchester to join uh, Co-op Digital. So the Co-op is undertaking its own digital journey. Uh, and I would encourage you, any of you developers who are looking to work with an ethical company with cooperative values, to, to look us up. Uh, because I'm very interested in what the idea of cooperatives can offer in an internet age. And I'll finish <coughs> by just listing some of the books that inform the talk in case you might want to read a bit further about it. And I particularly recommend Super Sad True Love Story, which is a very interesting novel set in the future, which predicts we will all be working in either media or credit. Thank you for your time. Can you sit over here? Hi, Amir. Thanks a million for that talk. It was no very thought-provoking and <laughs> full of great stuff. So um, we've had a few people uh, pose a few questions mm -hmm. along the way. Um, one thing that actually struck me was Kevin Spacey features quite uh, often in their slides. <laughs> yeah, Is he yes. a secret robot overlord? <laughs> but um, Tom was wondering whether in the future will government enforce regulations on social and search platforms? I think it will have to, uh, but the problem with regulation is, you know, government work, it works very slowly. Uh, obviously, the technology community, community and innovation happens very quickly. Uh, and so you build platforms that get to very critical mass at speed. Uh, so obviously, you know, Facebook, we, we never thought that would grow to a billion users. It's, an, it's a utility, right? So. So, so government should surely regulate utilities. The question is, do we have public servants and officials who, are, who have enough knowledge about technology to know the kind of regulation that's required? So I think it's always going to be a bit of a cat and mouse. But I think ultimately, um, you know, all our utility companies had to, had to go under regulation. I see no difference with technology platforms. But is it likely to happen without activism? No. Right. Okay. <laughs> That's why I was hoping we might get some activism here. <laughs> gotcha. Um, do you think that the, the governments will actually be able to understand the technology, given that it moves so fast? Like, would it require uh, the, the technology giants or whatever to actually get involved with government? Yeah, and I, well, what, I would, what I would hope to see is that the technology giants would understand that regulation will come, and so to step up to start defining what that might look like in collaboration with government. We have also new generations of uh, tech, you know, technologists going into government. We certainly have that in the UK and certainly have in the US. So there is, there is a growing uh, uh, literacy around technology which wasn't there before in government, but it's certainly not anything at the mass that it's required. And I think the other side that's missing is that Really, most people, you know, most people who don't understand technology have no idea about the level of intrusion into their lives from technology companies. And it's a kind of a game. Technology companies don't want to declare too much about it because they need as much data as they can get to build their products. So, you know, everybody's a bit of a cat and mouse, really, of not really declaring and people not knowing. So you don't have that body of activism coming from the body public because they're not as aware of what's being surveilled. Gotcha. Do you think we'll actually see um, a move towards people happily paying for services rather than getting them for free and you know, using their data as currency? Absolutely, yeah, and I think that's where, where, we, you know, that's where we need to go. Uh, because you know, in truth, what can you do if you're, if you're availing of a service for free? You know, that's the contract that you exchange. Now mind you, Facebook's terms and conditions are as long as the US Constitution, so I doubt if anybody's actually gonna go through those. But yeah, absolutely, I think that's, that's the way it should be. Okay. So uh, Rachel was wondering, um, what, what's required for uh, the social engineering of a society to be successful? Well, yeah, that's the point I made. It's, it's, you know, you have to know a lot about the society you're trying to engineer or affect. 
and you have to have, to have tools with which to do it. Now, as I say, with, with the Stasi, we understood they collected lots of information. They were listening to people's phone calls. They were following them you know, in an analog way, collecting data about them that would make them vulnerable and therefore susceptible to, to force. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so basically, if you have lots and lots of data about absolutely everything a person is doing uh, and you have you know, a, a large platform, then, I mean, we know from Facebook carrying out experiments without asking uh, the you know, users, and manipulating news feeds to see could they, uh, could they make them happier or did certain stories make them happier or sad. That's classic social engineering. That's taking your tools and the information you have and manipulating people without their consent. And that's, you know, deeply unethical. Indeed. Um, do you think the likes of Facebook actually set out to do evil or is it entirely accidental? No, no, I, I don't think, you know... I think there's a maturity issue as well. I mean, you know, Mark Zuckerberg famously said when he was very young, you only have one identity. Okay, I mean, he's in his early 20s. That's what you think, right? But we all know when you get older, you've got many identities. You have the identity you have here on the stage. You have the identity you have at home. You know, so there's a... Uh, it, it was an emergent thing. I mean, this is the fantastic thing about technology. You can't predict what's going to emerge. You know, he created a social network for, for a university, effectively. Um, so no, I don't think, but I think the evil creeps in when you know, right? Because now we know, right? And that's the point where you have to say, what, what is to be done about this? What are we going to do about this? Gotcha, gotcha. Um, have you any particular sort of favorite examples of, of where people have started uh, a platform or a service and inadvertently been, I don't know, collecting unusual data or data they shouldn't or, or, or coming up with a service that they shouldn't be actually doing at all? Well, I think one of the ones I particularly found uh, a bit noxious was, um, uh, what's it called, Girls Around Me. So, you know, people can take, obviously, the, the fire hose from Twitter. And so basically, you, I, I downloaded the app on my phone because I was doing it for the purpose of a presentation. And it, it locates you. So I could locate girls around me. And so I found to be provocative, of course, young girl, maybe 13, and because she lives near me, right? And then I can pretty much figure out what her locale is, and then I say, well, she's, that's her Instagram account. I can probably get her Twitter account. So then you find out she's checked into Foursquare. You know exactly where she is. Now, she has no idea that that's happening, right? Mm -hmm. It's publicly available data that's been used, but, you know, that's a perfect stalking tool. Now, you know, where are the ethical boundaries around that? Right. So she has no knowledge, nor did any of the women who were featured on that. They're just pulling in randomly their social profiles. So you have to question, you know, what, what are Twitter's policy around that? But in parallel, I guess, to Twitter having policies and government having regulation, is it down to education of, of the populace, like uh, the actual users? This is what you're signing up for. This is what you're getting yourself into. For sure. But I mean, of course, what we all love about technology is, is we strip out the com complexity. You know, so we all want to make beautiful things and we all want to have that really easy to use and we don't want to be burdening the user with a whole lot of stuff. We all know, you know, if you, you know, it's like we have BT Wi-Fi in, in London and every time it comes on my phone, I'm going, I don't want this. So it's a, it's a conflict between making beautiful things, useful things, and also explaining to the user exactly what you're doing. I mean, upfronting what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the tension, right? And the other tension is most startups or young companies just want to build users. They don't really want to think too much um, about anything else. And again, Mark Zuckerberg was asked, maybe two years into the company, some of his senior executives were saying, we need a strategy. What's the strategy? And he went away for three weeks, and he came back with one slide which said, get more users. You know, that's the strategy, right? So, so there, are, there are tensions there. I'm not saying, you know, that's easy, but I'm saying there are tensions between that. Right. Um, on a slightly different note, David was querying about uh, the robots coming to take our jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and he was wondering whether the robots will ever be able to innovate and improve on their processes like people can. Well, I think that's what the software is telling us, right? It's a learning machine. You know, it's, 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 it'll become self-learning at some point. But uh, I probably wouldn't have the technical depth of knowledge we have done, so I'm sure loads <laughs> of people in the audience would be able to answer that. Fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. 
Um, now, you'll note that I've gone entirely analog now after listening okay. to all of that, so I'm going to have to flick back through my questions. Um, so you've got lots of fingers and lots of pies, like with, with Future Everything and EY UK and Disruption and all the rest. What's your favorite? What gets you most excited when you get up in the morning at the moment? Uh, well, at the moment, it's working for co-op, uh, for, for co-op digital. Uh, so as I say, we're, we're moving the digital team from the main cooperative headquarters into a building called Federation. And we're trying to encourage other technology companies to co-locate with us there. Uh, and we would hope to have some startups, etc. So really working with uh, smaller companies as well to explore the idea of cooperatism as, as a means of, of you know, looking at how do we have more equitable distribution in the digital economy. You know, the cooperative is a very good model. It's a very long-standing model. And so I'm very excited about that, yeah. But I, I like all the things that I do. Cool, cool, brilliant. Um, so if you had, say, um, one message, one take home for people, one like sound bite, what would it be? Ask more questions, you know, I mean, I think that's the, and think more deeply about, you know, I think many software developers are put in positions where, you know, they're asked to do things by people where they feel this is wrong, you know, it's about having the courage to speak up and look at the broader societal implications about that and to be, to encourage others and to be truthful about what uses, you know, data, for example, is being used for and what potential harms are. Uh, and to raise that, you know, more publicly. Okay, cool. Well, uh, I think I'm out of questions. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, give Imer a big round of applause for an amazing talk. Thanks a million. <laughs>